in a way, you still have this analysis, it's just it's where is it in the study? Thank you. You just reminded me of a slide which I didn't put in my deck, but I'll show it to you afterwards, of how you can avoid the if-then-else if you design carefully. There are some if-then-elses. We're going to have them because that's the way we think, and we want those things. You know, it's, it's our, part of our human desire to, to want those things. But they can be minimized. Um, Actually, it's not part of human desire. There is, in the theory of algorithms, uh, it is proven that there, you need these three things, like sequence, uh, decision, and iteration. Like, you cannot describe anything without these three. So it's a, uh, it's a, a Don, Don Giacopini, I think, is the theory. Uh, the theory. So, but the theory of algorithms is based on linear logic, which doesn't apply to this kind of parallel logic, actually. It's, uh, it's a separate thing. But you're right, I mean, there are cases in which these things will come up. Um, yeah. uh, quick question, you mentioned Netflix twice. Do Netflix use a safe engine? Uh, I don't believe they do, but uh, that doesn't matter, right? <laughs> So what when Netflix does pretty much they just scale over from one machine to another. That's pretty much it. Like when Popra talks about that, he talks about scaling over machines and nodes, not like scaling over services and applications mm -hmm. and pretty much everything. Like it's very difficult to scale over everything. Right? Actually, that's not true. Um, Adrian, actually, let's talk about building over big things. He talks not only about the Chaos Monkey but the Godzilla Monkey, which builds over not only entire data centers but entire countries. Right, right. But so that's, they have that technology, that and you can actually download it from. Yeah, I, I, I read actually that article, but I'm saying he's talking about filling over the data center, he's filling over the whole thing, but, but not filling over at a very granular level. It's very a low level machine. machine. Well, you expect load balancers and local payloads to be yeah. there. Let's uh, run through the, the, there's a few slides left, uh, but this is a good discussion, that I think will hopefully bl blossom at the end. So this, this way of vertical scaling systems that we did in the past, this is kind of the old way. I think it, we're going to see the end of this now. We can use Moore's law to brute force things into higher performance, but eventually we're going to end up trying to parallelize things. And when we parallelize things, <coughs> this is more the kind of picture that we're going to end up with. We try to keep things nice and tidy and crystalline and beautiful because that's what we've been taught. We were only ever taught to build simple systems. People who work with complex systems like biologists, uh, doctors, chemists, they think more like this. They're not trying to build perfectly crystalline systems. We often confuse tidiness with reliability, resilience, perfection. It's part of our psyche to think that if something is tidy and simple, it's going to be you know, good somehow. Not necessarily true. This is one of the most resilient things on the planet. And it's all formed by microservices, individual organisms interacting with one another in a complex web. <coughs> and it's that web of complexity which gives it its resilience. It seems totally out of control. It's very hard to understand, but it's super reliable. <laughs> Did you have a design pool? What's that? Did you have a design pool? Well. <laughs> Did you have a design pool? I'm not going to no, get no, into no, that no, question. That's almost a thought like you just discussed. And I'm, I'm willing to consider it if I can understand it. And so was there a designer? As you said, policy has a designer who has a goal in mind. So in so other words, what, what, what should be resilient there? Is it a tree? Is it a monkey? Is it a, because I think all of them are fairly all over the place, right? No, I think there is a... Teleology. Is no, there an I'm, I'm, not, I'm actually not trying to elevate this into the abstract, <laughs> but um, I, the promise theory, I actually think I'm trying to really understand what you're talking about. And the <laughs> promise theory idea seems to be that you start from the goals, right? And if this is a, a good example of a complex system that we should use as a guide, then that would imply to me that you're also saying there was a goal when the jungle was I feel like there's a big trap for me to fall into here. <laughs> but, um, that, it's kind of the opposite of what I'm saying, but I understand why you think that. So these goals um, can, well, so this goal, I don't believe anyone designed this thing. I believe it fell into a local minimum, you know, by all the things that were going on. And ultimately, as we build complex systems out of IT, we'll have to deal with that as well. 
it will fall into some local minimum, which either works or doesn't. But we are not going to stop trying to push it into the minimum that we want, right? Yeah. But we're going to have to learn that that we do now not by trying to ride the horse, but rather by herding the, the flock. So um, it's I a different way of management. Yeah, and I'm, I'm willing to embrace that. So these, are, these questions are not hostile questions. But it seems to me that most people who deploy applications for a living have a time scale they have to operate in. It's that economics column you put on your word slide. Yep. And if I have to wait for these things to settle, I'm up against the clock. Yep. And here in the jungle, I, didn't, I wasn't up against the clock. I wasn't even there right? <laughs> when the jungle evolved. So how do I deal with the constraints of time and the settling? Thank you. I mean, you put your finger right on the heart of the issue, but I, I'm afraid you're like way outside the scope of my talk today. But before I forget that point, I'm just going <coughs> to give you one of these things. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I have a have signed one. one. I'll take it. <laughs> I have it in my pocket. This one is signed. <laughs> could, could I ask a related question, though? Yeah. What's your assumption about these goals changing? I could see a very different environment where there's a very stable goal, and then, like, just a compilation process. You could take a goal, look at it centrally, and compile it into parallel things that work with semaphores or whatever to work together. But if you're in an environment where the goals are changing pretty rapidly, you have a very, very different problem. So are you making assumptions about kind of the, the goals being pretty constant? Again, you, you and him. <laughs> it's all about the time scales and the, the limits of your environment. If you have an environment which is more complex than your system, forget it. You're screwed. Because that environment is going to attack your system and punch it in all different kinds of ways, perturb it in so many different ways, it's going to be all over the place. You will have no stability, no predictability, no certainty. But if you can put your system in a place of relative calm, isolate it sufficiently so that it's weakly coupled to a, a basically stable thing, your system is changing faster than the environment around it, then you get to control a little bit and, and predict. Well, I'm talking about an example like SLAs. So you have a system where yeah. you have, I mean, ideally you describe things more in terms of quality of service and SLAs. Yeah. And that's going to change over time or a new application comes. So you're going to really get goals that really evolve unless you have a very static data center where things don't change. Absolutely. And we, we all know that SLAs are often given optimistically. And, uh, you know, <laughs> I was watching, did you guys see James Micken's talk from Monitorama? If you want to, to be entertained, look at James Micken's uh, keynote from Monitorama, just, have, just came out on Vimeo. He, says, uh, he said of SLAs that in a complex environment, what you end up with is you have your average SLA and then like 12 standard deviation oscillations around it. Your SLA is fine but you ignored the fact that uh, you had these huge oscillations around it. So it depends how you define it. But you've got to have sufficient stability for something to end up being predictable. I'm going to take the question at the end. So you know, we're, making, we're ending up with complexity as we try to scale systems in parallel. And in modern data centers, in order to bring about that parallelization, we're kind of shoving all of this complexity down on the network engineers. Because the connectivity of that network we're creating is about the most important thing for that horizontal scaling. Um, that's a different kind of problem. And this kind of network architecture that uh, is, is now being used is still kind of fragile, and it's still <coughs> It's actually a sequence of stress concentrations, as we'd say in physics. We have places where things, these, each one of these switches is a, a, a failure point with a backup. But it's still a failure point. And there is a possibility for if you take out one of those switches that it's so oversubscribed that it'll hit the next one, and that'll go down and hit the next one, and you have a cascade failure. So this, this kind of structure is basically fragile just like certain materials are basically fragile. There are different crystalline structures. Here's another crystalline structure, which is 
kind of more robust than that. It doesn't have any of those individual um, stress concentrations at the moment, unless something fails. And I think if we're talking about the future and we're talking about scaling up planet-wide services in massive scale and massive numbers of applications, we're really talking about moving the computing power, the fabric in which we compute services all over the planet in substations, not just Amazon's basement. But this is going to be at the end of your street in a little box next to the phone connections and the electricity submeter and you, know, it'll, you have a little cloud station next to your electricity meter or something. Because all of this stuff has to spread out. And it has to spread out with sufficient caching and replication and denormalization and container. All of these things have to be taken care of. It's incredible complexity. And our linear models of thinking are completely unprepared for this. Anybody remember Blake 7? ORAC is the future of data centers, right? So I, I'm making a joke, but sometime in the future, these what we call a data center could maybe be 3D printed. You know, we, why do we have a different box for the servers and then connect them with another box with wires in between? All these cables, it's just like, um, why couldn't we take away all those connections and make them hardwired and just print the whole thing in a, in a solid lump? Well, in the future, we probably can. Right now, we can't because of the heat, of course, but um, when, if we figure out how to deal with the heat problem in semiconductors, then we could probably do that. When we can do that, we can make massive improvements in density, uh, speed, etc. It'll be trivial to stick a cloud data center in next to your electricity meter. It'll be all over the planet, under the streets. You know, at the end of the 90s, there was this idea of pervasive computing where we'd have like sensors and uh, control panels embedded in the walls. <coughs> Didn't quite happen like that, but wait another few years and we'll see it in a different way, trust me. The computing will be everywhere and much more, um, much more complex than just a control panel. In my book, the one that I just uh, gave out, I have some more here as well, um, I s tried to explain the evolution of how we think about technical issues. And I think this says something about you know, us as a, a species. We basically solve problems as a human cognitive issue to begin with. We have to try it ourselves, we do it manually, we fiddle around and we come up with a, a solution call it a genetic algorithm or whatever you like, but we come up with a solution by hand. And then we kind of get better at doing it, we rehearse it, we practice it, and it becomes somewhat machine-like. And when we figured out how to automate this, we build a machine to do it. Or we start acting like machines, you know, we have processes, ITIL approved processes. And then when we've done that, we can make a machine that imitates what the human does. But then we realize, <coughs> Making a machine imitate what a human does is kind of silly because the machine could probably do it its own way more effectively. And then we figure out real automation and how that works, which is an autonomous automation, not limited by human storytelling and in imperative stories and linear thinking, but parallelized, autonomous, le loosely coupled, highly scalable. And then when we've done that, the only thing left is to scale it out horizontally. There's still one thing left, though. Even if we can solve that problem, I think we can. It's not going to be easy, but we, we, I think we can solve this problem with promise-like thinking. We still have to know how are we going to interact with those machines. Because we mustn't forget that this is all for us, ultimately. And unless we have a way of building a relationship with the people we want, with the applications we want, with the data we want, with the services we want, then it's all for nothing, because it's all for us, ultimately. That's what I try to figure out, explore in my book. I hope some, of, some more of you will take a look at this and, and consider some of these thoughts, because it's a very complicated issue. 
And it goes as much to our culture and our desire to build relationships with one another and with machines and tools and things we do as it does to the technologies that can efficiently compute the right algorithm to solve the technical problem. It's not about the technical problems in the end, it's about quality of life and society. We're having a conference in September, and I'm hoping that some of you will come and discuss some of these issues with us there. It's in September, 17th to the 19th, right here. And uh, I would love to hear more. I'd love to continue this discussion now, but I would love for you to come and join some industry leaders in talking about these issues as well, because I've been fascinated about how the, some of these ideas of promise theory are spreading um, especially in the networking space, where, perhaps not surprisingly, the complexity is being forced upon networking, like it or not. But I'm, I'm encouraged that some of these ideas are starting to come to the fore now, and we're thinking about these issues in new ways, challenging ourselves to think new, and moving away from the old thinking. And so it would be great if, uh, if you came and joined in that discussion. And with that, I'd like to just end my talk, but I'd be very happy to continue the discussion and have more more comments uh, if this time, if the organizers will permit. Yeah, of course we can do that. Um, we can take some questions. So, so thanks. Does anybody want to have ask any questions? Yes. For the beginners, what are the couple summaries, summary points? <laughs> By this book <laughs> and the other one. Oh, sorry, I'm, I'm kidding. No, um, so I just, um, I need to get rich, you see, so I need to sell a couple of them. But um, so the key points are that, com that in order to handle the kind of complexity and scale that we need to satisfy our insatiable desire for human freedoms, we're going to have to break things up into atomic pieces that scale horizontally rather than vertically. And they should be weakly coupled because that will bring the resilience that we are used to from biology and chemistry and material science. The things we rely on in everyday life kind of work like that, in the physical things, the biological things. But in computer science, we still believe in these towers, of these houses of cards. Which is a cultural thing that we think we have to, it's a shift that we have to go through in computer science. And I guess that's my, my main message. Uh, I have sort of mixed feelings about the notion of microservices, but ultimately I, I do agree with Adrian Cockcroft that that is the way to scale systems. Um, whether it's the way to design systems can be discussed, but it is the way to scale systems. Um, did you get your question? I think we were. Was that okay? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yes. Um, you know, Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so Luke used to be a CF Engine user, and because I was so slow, he left <laughs> to start his own company. It's fine. <laughs> he had he had a different idea, and he explored that, and I think he did. And he made a nice job of exploring a different avenue of trying to break up the configuration problem. He uh, was interested in object orientation 
and class inheritance and this kind of model, which is your classic computer science model. Um, I wouldn't let him put that model in CF Engine because I don't believe in that model. Because I believe that that model is the house of cards. Uh, in the, the promise model, you try to keep everything as flat as possible. And you have namespaces which are more like sets that overlap. And we kind of disagreed on those points. I don't think we disagree that much anymore because Puppet has sort of recaptured some of those things from CF Engine. And CF Engine has uh, taken on the concept of containers, um, not stacked containers like Puppet, but they work in more like, in, more like other containers, I suppose, more like machine containers. So both of these tools have been part of a part of the exploration of how to solve this problem. Chef came along and split away from Puppet because uh, you know, they had their own issues with, uh, with Puppet. And they wanted to appeal more to this idea of bringing value fast by using the power of programmers. You know, by, by employing very smart programmers, we can tr maybe make this work just by sheer skill. I also don't think that that's the right way to do it because then you're super reliant on very skilled individuals. So as soon as one of those goes away, you're stuck. So my concept at CF Engine has been to build based on principles that no matter how, um, that if we do it right, it will be so resilient and so robust and unbreakable that the system will just keep on working, will just keep on running and it will be stable. Now, <coughs> the, the time scales on which we want to change things in the modern world of applications is increasing. So that notion of stability is also changing. Back in the 90s when I started CF Engine, you, you, you built a machine and it didn't change much for a year. Now we're talking about rolling out continuous delivery, new versions of software, and we want to make changes on time scales of minutes or seconds. And then your notion of stability needs to be adjusted to consider which bits of the system, <coughs> pardon me, which bits of the system need to be stable and persistent, and which bits of the system need to be ephemeral. But it's only by having a clear model of all of these processes and how they interact, that we will ever achieve that goal. I don't think that any of the configuration management systems today have the answer to that problem. I don't think that Docker has that problem, which is like the new thing that everyone is saying is going to take away config management. I do think that Docker plus configuration, fast configuration management, like CF Engine is fast, right? <laughs> I do think that the, the marriage of those two things together can take the next, go to the next step, take the next step. Um, but there are still many problems to be solved. What's important is we're thinking about these problems and, and we're aware of these problems because then we can solve them. But right now I think um, CF Engine, Puppet, Chef, Pansible, Salt, they all have their own ways of dealing uh, with the current state of issues, and none of them are 100% suited to the challenge of rapid, continuous delivery. But we're going to get there. It's not too far away. And of course, I think CF Engine Way is the right way, otherwise I wouldn't be doing it. Yes. Sorry, I couldn't hear the question. Mm. How do you stabilize a complex dynamic system? Great question. You do it by separating the time scales. You have to see which things need to be stable relative to, to something else. So, for example, if my keyboard, if the layout of my keyboard is changing faster than I can type, it's useless to me. It has to be stable for long enough for me to type my document. If it changes after that, I don't care. So it's not 
about the absolute times but the relative time scales depending on whatever processes are running together and competing with one another. Does that make sense? Without, uh, without so got the beginning of it. Okay, I'm sorry, I didn't. So she's asking how do you do it without a control? You have a control. Oh, how do you do it without a control? So the, in the promise model, you, at least in my rendering of the promise model in CF Engine, each promise is continuously maintained. And so there is kind of an internal control loop there, which is trying to converge you to that desired state or, or to keep the promise continuously. So it's, it's the marriage of continuous promise keeping with um, promise declaration, if you like, that, that creates a sort of competitive uh, equilibrium. It's, an equ it's about an equilibrium, it's trying to find an equilibrium. But that equilibrium is an infinite if check, right? Yeah, so you're trying to, exactly, you're trying to converge towards the desired end state, and that desired end state is the stable thing. Even if the actual state is fluctuating, the, the average state can still be stable enough to base your system on. If it's not, you can't, then you, you know, then you're done. You're saying you're not using GIFs, but uh, when you do that iteration, you have to do GIFs to compare the states, right, to see whether you're using the state or not, right? This is a different place. Not necessarily. Um, if I an if-free convergence, gravity. If you have a, a potential, then if you have a guiding potential, you you have no explicit decisions. You can guide the thing to converge. I'll do it again. But that uh, what you're making multiple comparisons, and that's the if statement. So you're dropping repeatedly, and you stop dropping, and you achieve the state you want. But that if you wanted the state of uh, not falling in the middle, if you design your system correctly, or if you design it in a particular way, I think you don't necessarily need an if to make that work. Maybe you do sometimes, but for example, you, a place where you do is in passing complex structures with patterns which are non-regular patterns. So because you know from Chomsky's theorem that non-regular patterns have uh, require computation to pass, increasing levels of state machines you know, to, to pass these things. So then you, you will need some decisions. But if they're simple regular patterns and if you can keep everything as simple as, as, as that, then you don't need decisions to, to make it work. That's not true. Actually, the, the, the parser combinators uh, which you are describing, they're internally using decisions, so they cannot decide, for example, what to pick from all the choices if they don't make a decision, right? I just said that if, you, you if you're doing theory. parsing of, of non-regular languages, you do need decisions, but if you're doing regular languages, you don't really need them. The Chomsky describes so in the context of grammar. In this case, particular case, you're dropping it, but I wanted to hold in the back. If I kept my hand, which is an if, and then dropped it, then I would have hold it. In other words, I wanted that step, and then do my uh, uh, next actions. Here, since I didn't do anything. You're hung up on this ordering, aren't you? <laughs> Forget about that. But isn't the handout the irregular pattern? <coughs> what is it? I mean, I'm trying. I'm new to this topic, but I'm just following no, along no, here. I'm saying uh, the hand out, trying to stop it here. That's the irregular part. But if you just let it go all the way down, it's not irregular. It's a regular pattern. You don't need the if statement. Did I, did I get that right? Yeah, but he he wants to put ordering into it somehow. He wants to prove that you need to order things. Oh. No, no, it depends on <laughs> what is your goal. If your goal is to keep it in the middle. But that would be the irregular part, and therefore you might need an if. That's a multi goal. Right. Then you need to define a table. We talked about so it, it kind of makes sense to, to design your system around the things you know you can make stable. If you don't know you can keep something stable, it's like if you, if you base your entire business on keeping a ball at the top of a, a point. It's not a very good business model. <laughs> but if you keep it at the bottom of a valley, it's much, you're, you're safer. Uh, I have a question. Uh, 
have a question. The promise theory allows you to do uh, consistency or speed or scalability. What is that uh, going to help? So promise theory is just a descriptive framework that allows you to analyze these things. The, these sort of emergent effects like scalability, speed, and so on, they will come about by, uh, by understanding the physics of these networks. It's sort of a separate thing, but you can think it's part of promises if you like, but it's, formally it's, it's a different thing to promise theory. But there are perfectly good physics principles about networks which allow us to understand when things will scale and how fast they can go, you know, what the latencies will be, and so on. These are absolutely the crucial questions that we need to, to, to learn about today to scale some of these modern architectures. So you have a slide here about the lattice structure that you mentioned. Um, it brings about uh, uh, stability, right? What's the theory behind that? Gosh. Um, think of the physics of materials. I mean, if you if you create a, a crystal of atoms, it becomes a new thing. Not like any one of the atoms inside it. So the, one, the principles of physics is that as you scale up, as you put lots and lots of things together, you, had, and you achieve a new scale, say an order of magnitude bigger than an atom, then the details of that smaller scale start to become less and less important. And it's the collective thing, that, the properties of the collective thing that then become important. This is why microservices, horizontal scaling, is the way to scale resiliently. Because even if your microservices are full of bugs and are not, not terribly reliable, it doesn't matter. Because there'll be a sufficient number of them to be able to catch those failures um, just by sheer redundancy. Brute force in parallel rather than brute force <coughs> In vertical. You, you know, could, could you use like shipping containers as an as a metaphor for this as well? Because well, no, but I, well, okay, maybe they use it too. But the concept is the bigger thing is made up of little things that scale, you know, and, and are predictable and behave a way that you expect. And the overall larger system basically is made up of a whole bunch of these little promises that keep getting delivered upon wherever the shipping containers arrive. And there's those containers kept. I think it's the opposite. Those containers kept totally separately. What? In the Docker world, they're trying to say these are totally well, separate containers. Well, I'm not bringing in the Docker thing. I'm just simply talking about shipping containers. So, <laughs> sorry for the double <laughs> meaning there. But you know, it, I'm always impressed when I look at shipyards and have just a bazillion of these things, and I'm just wondering, my God, how do they keep track of these well, all over the world? But they're huge containers. That's not just like completely unordered stuff. These people are doing just-in-time manufacturing. So that stuff isn't a pipeline and depending on, on like, fast so, but, but there's a, a heck of a lot of pre behaviors there. The, the thing that, uh, that I'm not entirely sure is because if one of those things is actually, like if it's a, a single thing's property is, is weak because if it, everything is like the same thing, the whole thing can actually collapse instead of providing no, resilience I mean, because like there's no variance in the system. Simon have the same uh, lattice. Uh, so if you're trying to transmit electricity across that, uh -huh. any one defect in an atom, say it's, it's xenon for some reason instead of uh, a carbon, won't really matter, stuff will route around. If there's two or three or five or 12 defects, it doesn't really matter. Where on the other ones, if you had two of the mid-tier Cisco's go out, you're fucked. Uh, oh, so well, well, what you're essentially <laughs> saying is to, to just have multiple lengths, and lattice is a structure to achieve multiple lengths. That's how our brain works, right? Our brain yes. has a ton of neurons, uh, neurons connecting each other, yeah. and uh, <laughs> and uh, and because there's a redundancy in connections, that's how internet works. It, I mean, it doesn't have to be a regular lattice. I mean, the regular right. lattice is is easy to understand. It's cheap to build, yep. so it and it, it, therefore it lends itself to artificial structures. This is also super resilient because it's got gazillions of connections. They're all over the place, but there are so many of them that it doesn't matter. And there will, you know, there will be little stress concentrations and points of failure in this, but it doesn't matter because there's so much. You know, that's I think that's the point. To the container analogy, I think there's a great point in there, which is that, um, as you were saying at the back, if we add labels on things, they have different semantics, and so we can't 
uh, it's, there's not a question of scaling them away. But uh, what physics kind of says is that as we go higher up the level, the individual labels on things matter less, and that the, the more scale we add, the less those individual labels actually matter to the behavior of the total thing. So it's kind of like thinking on a whole new level. It's like instead of nanotechnology, as I mentioned at the beginning, instead of designing little molecules which are perfect applications, we're designing uh, a, a liquid or like a medicine or a, a tissue or a, a you know, replacement leg which has a whole different properties than a single thing. What are you, um, I'm a little confused about what you're actually prescribing. I understand kind of from a semantic perspective how it's very useful to g describe things in terms of goals and preconditions, etc. But are you prescribing that the way you configure a system is by at the lower level you, you, you like um, configure each of these individual um, agents or are you prescribing that promises are at a high level and you have some type of compilation process that actually pushes it down uh, or that they're all consistent? Is, so how specific are you about prescribing? Great question. Uh, there are different ways to do it, but I do like the idea that you could write a kind of a story, a human story. Again, to this point that we have these, we're, we're obsessed with stories, but if when we think microscopic stories, it's very fragile. If we could now take a story and compile it into stuff that's built of this, <laughs> then yes, I, I think that that's probably the way that we're going to end up doing it, just because what I know about people. I think you're right. Have okay. you heard of Plan 9? I'm sorry? Have you heard of Plan 9? Plan 9, yeah. From outer space. The movie? From Outer Space. <laughs> no, the operating system. Ed Wood, yeah. <laughs> uh, there's, a, there's an operating system called Plan 9? Yes. Is sorry, you've been space? trying to ask a question for some time. But, um, so, how much of a, a direct analogy to uh, biological selectionism are you drawing here? Because in a selectionist system, variability is sort of inherent in the agents and there's a selective force, if you want to call it, to, to avoid the teleological problems, mm -hmm. uh, which I guess would be analogous to your goal. So in that case, it doesn't matter <coughs> what's going on inside, as long as the variability keeps getting selected. So selection is something that happens in the context of a, an environment where there are certain pressures or comp comp competition. <laughs> competition. Yeah. Um, and it's the competition which adds the selection, and certain strategies will favor certain, will be favored in that environment. And so you can't really talk about selection without the environment. But w what's important about what you say is that as we build more complex things like this, we will be un under the fire of competitive, <laughs> losing the ability to speak now, competitive pressures of those kinds, which will lead to selection natural selection, if you like, or artificial selection, but it won't be controlled by us. It will be a function of the total system rather than something we've designed. Sure. Yes, at the back. So is, is that why the appeal of the Netflix kind of model where you have these um, fairly autonomous little processes that are stable within themselves to the degree that's necessary, and a bunch of them together are stable enough? Yes. Yeah, so, maybe we... I just wanted to, real quick, just comment on that, and then we'll take How much one, time one or two more have? questions and then we'll wrap up. But okay. just on that, does that mean that there needs to be failure built into the system? Like, that you want to encourage survival and, and uh, non-survival? Do we want to encourage survival and build in failure protections? Well, no, 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 like if you have all these little service microservices mm. does the system work better if if through some sort of natural selection some of them do fail oh i see you so if some of them do fail do. does it make it more resilient yeah um, 
<laughs> well, it might. I mean, uh, well, there's a bigger feedback loop. If you if you find failures and fix them, then you're improving the system. Yeah. So the internet actually works like this. Routing yeah. works like mm -hmm. route. I have to say routing in California. Now. <laughs> routing works like this because it drops packets when when a switch is oversubscribed, in order to allow the greater good of of a package that's going through, and so it. You know, by fa by certain things failing, you're making room for for others in in that sense. So it could, you know, you know, in a competitive scenario, all kinds of funny things can happen near saturation. So yeah. You're a long way from those systems. Okay. Actually, uh, we're not as far away no, from. I mean, to the wall. Not, oh, not that's that there's failure, yeah. but if it produced predictable certain outcomes. Oh, golly. We're a long way Oh, yes. So there's the difference between the future, the title of your talk, and what most people are grounded in day to day operation. Absolutely. But I do believe we understand the fundamentals of how to build those systems today. It's just that nobody has uh, put them all together yet. Maybe some people are doing it, starting to think about it. A good example of that is you have a bad outage, you lose a pain in the ass customer, you realize it's worth it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. If I may, straight from the theoretical to the practical. So you've, you've got a, a, a set of goals you declare your promises. You necessarily start from an initial condition and a dependency graph that you have to traverse. Um, Why? Pardon me? Why do you have to start from an initial condition? How, just how do you bootstrap CF? Oh, you mean you start, when you start running CF Engine, you are in some state? Right. So okay. you have to map from the declarative Good. promise thing to the practical stuff you have to work with right, right. now. Yep. Um, and a lot of us are dealing with package managers, and we're not going to be allowed to build our own OS distributions and install open source and things like that. Uh, I have a particular uh, case that I keep running into with, with um, RPM dependencies. Okay. So I wonder, you know, do you ever find when you're when you're developing this thing, do you get into a cycle in that graph? How do you detect that? How do you get out of it? Um, you know, how do you do you say, okay, we're not going down this. Do you break this edge and go down that way? Uh, great question. <coughs> so, is given that we end up with graphical complexity, can we end up with routing loops in the traversal of the configuration state itself? Now, CF Engine can never get into that state because each promise type has been crafted to be orthogonal so that a change in one cannot affect a change in another. So that there's no mutual dependencies. Um, things like package managers, I think this is where they've made a mistake. This is the, full, the flaw in the design of package managers as we understand them today. I do believe it's possible to make a package manager with dependencies, with some dependencies, which does not suffer from that problem. And there have been attempts I think, you remember RPATH, and what was the name of their thing? They, they had a package manager, something beginning with C, as I recall. Hmm. Um, but they, I think they had a go at doing that. Uh, I'm not sure if they succeeded or not, but, but I, I definitely agree with you that they, there is the possibility of, in principle, having s scheduling loops in these, these things. That was one of my uh, peeves about the way Puppet did its uh, ordering of operations by trying to create uh, an acyclic graph from the list of things by creating a dependency tree. But the problem with that is that as you're reconfiguring the system, your model of the tree is also changing. You could change a configuration which affects the tree itself. So you could either end up going into a loop or never, or actually the tree doesn't cover part of your problem at all. So it can become disconnected and because the system is changing itself as it runs. So yes, we do have to deal with those issues, and uh, they're non-trivial. Um, I, I know that, that when I used the last, there had been concessions to that, which was, you do this set of promises, and then you go do this procedure, and then you go on to the So the way it works in CF Engine is to try to do an approximation to resolution of um, self-healing the graph, if you like. And you know that it's never going to be cyclic because actually